like a child. Okay? I thought like a child. That means I took inventory like a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. That word man there means fellow, husband, it means sir. As I was sitting back there, I thought about this because there's so many times people say, don't call me sir. You know, and I know they don't mean nothing by it. I know that what they mean. They mean don't put me up on a pedestal is what they're, they're thinking because it sounds good and everything like that. But I call people sir. I call my son sir. I call other people sir. I, call, I might call a brother in here. I might say, hey sir, how you doing today? You know, in my eyes, I, I, you know, it's just a respect thing and an honor thing. For people, for men, ma'am, I might call you ma'am, I might call my wife ma'am, I might call, you know, daughter ma'am, I might call, you know, those things, I'm not saying, uh, but, but when I got this, when I started studying it out, that man there means sir, husband, sir, I became a man, I became a, I became a, a, a husband, I become a man, I become, I, I started to change in the way that I thought, I, I started to change in the way that I took inventory of my life. The way that I judged things, the way that I looked at things started to, to, to look different than it did in an immature state. So I became, he said, he said this, he said, when I became, became there means to come into a being, to come into being, to arise, to be sent, to be assembled. To arise, to be assembled. I know a preacher, a preacher in our fellowship, he preached this message. He said, I seen it on there, I didn't get to see the message yet, but he said, he said, Jesus is not coming back for a baby. He's coming back for a bride. And I thought, man, that's a good, that's a good title. A good way to look at it. Because so many times we got a Christian body that is so, such an, in such an immature state. They're carnal in their thinking. And God's trying to take us into the spiritual things. But He can't get us into the spiritual things. But He can't get us out of our carnal minds. He can't get us out of the, the, the carnal sins, the carnal flesh. Are y'all hearing me today? So he said this, he said, I understood as a child, I thought, of, I thought as a child, but when I became a man, say, I'm becoming mature. Come on, say it with me, I'm becoming mature. When he talks about being perfect, he's talking about being mature. That means a mature state. That don't mean that you walk like, you don't, you don't make any kind of mistake or anything like that. He's talking about the way that you think, the way that you understand, the way that you talk. I can listen to somebody talk for a few minutes and I can pretty much locate where they're at and what they believe. I mean, I can't tell you everything about their life, but if I listen to you long enough, I can, kind of, I can almost locate where you're at. I can almost locate what you believe or, or what's going on. I mean, I can pretty much listen. Why? By, by listening to the words that you say. Yeah. So as you start to grow and develop, you're, you're, even your language will change as a Christian. Because the way that you see it's going to change. The way that you understand it's going to change. The way that you take inventory of your life is going to look different. Put away means to abolish. He said, I have put away. He said, when I, when I, when I understood, okay, I put away the childish things when I became mature, when I became different, when I became, amen, when I started to speak different, when I started to think different, on a more mature level, all of a sudden I put away these childish things. Yeah. No longer would I be in this childish state. Put away there means to cease, to destroy, to do away, to vanish. That means I've done away with those things. I'm not doing those things no more. I'm not operating in that place no more. Why? Because God's trying to take me to a higher place with Him. He's trying to take me deeper with Him, but He can't till He gets me out of this immature state. He's wanting to release something in our life, but can He? Because He can't. I mean, you, can't, you, you couldn't contain it. You couldn't handle it. John Maxwell says this right here. He says, we must learn, unlearn, and relearn. To grow. So many times we fail in this. And when I first heard this, it challenged my mind in the way that I thought. When I first heard him make this statement, I said, well, I'm going to learn, unlearn something and then learn it again. But I didn't throw it out. But it challenged the way that I was thinking at that moment and where I was at. And that's what we're supposed to do as pastors, as leaders, as preachers, is to challenge you where you're at so you can move from where you're at to where God's wanting to take you. But if he can't change the way you think, he can't change the places he's wanting to take you. 
So when he said that, I had to come back and I had to take inventory, not as a child, because a child, I would have inventoried it like this. I don't believe that. I don't care what you say. I don't, I don't want to hear nothing. I ain't never heard that. Duh. You ain't been able to hear it. That would have been a child immature state of inventory. Thank God I had a little bit of wisdom in that day. When I heard that, I thought, huh, let me think about that for a minute. I'm always judging something by Scripture anyway. I mean, is that right line up with the Word? Of course I'm judging it. Come on. So I'm like, learn, relearn, unlearn. Okay, what does that mean? Well, I learned something as a baby Christian, and then as I grow to another level, my perspective started to change. The inventory that I take starts to change. The way I thought changed. The way I speak is changing. So now i got to learn it. i got to unlearn what I learned, and then i got to relearn it. What am I relearning? I'm relearning the same thing. I'm letting Holy Spirit and His Word train me and teach me again the same thing but from a different perspective. This is how we grow. If you change your mind, you change your life. Why? Because if you change your mind, you change the way you speak. And we're going to get into that here in just a minute. I hope you all getting something here. I want to give you something that's going to help you. See, when you first start hearing this, you're going to, you'll be like, no, I don't want to hear. You know, but we want you to grow up and develop. We want you to be effective. Pastor Jody sent me something this morning. I love my wife, man. I love her. She's a Holy Ghost-filled woman. We go through the battles like no others. I'll be honest with you. And we ain't playing, we, we, we're always transparent with you. Okay, we try to be that way. We try to live that way. We try to live real and not in this cloud mentality like we don't have to fight the fight of faith we don't have to we don't have to go through the same things you do we don't make mistakes in our marriage we don't, I don't make mistakes as a husband because I'd be lying to you okay it's a work in progress so we don't want to be this these, these Christians that, that, that others can't attain we want to be transparent and real and genuine that right there people will honor more than they will anything else now, I'm not telling you got to air out all your stuff and all your sins that you committed. I'm not telling you got to air all that out to everybody. That's not what I'm telling you. But I'm telling you to get to a place where we're genuine, where we're transparent, okay? Where there's no ulterior motives in our life. I mean, you can reach that place as a Christian. I believe that with all my heart. You know, even, even in the Old Testament, what we consider the Old Testament, the, the four Gospels when Jesus was on the earth, he was still under the Old Covenant. Yeah. He was the New Test. He was the church, but he was until his resurrection, the new church wasn't birthed. Right. Not until he was crucified, went into the heart of the earth, and the Holy yeah. Spirit raised him from the dead. That's, right. that's when the new covenant. Even though we say that's still, you know, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, we still consider that New Testament. But really, when he was on the earth, it was under the old covenant. That's why he had to operate in certain ways, and he had, he couldn't even become a priest and step into that fully till he was thirty years of age. Why? Because he still had to go buy some things. He still had to go by some of the things that, that was set in place by God himself and by Jesus. Come on, Jesus is God. Amen. You know what I'm saying? 100% God, 100% man when he was in the earth, right? Okay. So he, he, he got to see this picture here. And so what I'm saying is, help me, help me here for a second. My wife sends me this, this thing. This, I'm sitting there praying and I'm in the closet. Usually I wouldn't even answer my phone. I usually take Facebook off. I mean, I usually just... Put my phone away because I'm in here praying in tongues. I'm walking around the church. I'm praying in tongues. I'm praying for each one of you all. I'm praying for what God's going to do. I'm declaring some things. I'm prophesying some things where he's taking us, not where he brought us from, but I'm thanking him for where he brought us from, but I'm prophesying to where we're going. I'm praying for you all. I'm praying for your families. I'm walking around. I'm praying for those that's coming. I'm praying for our, everything that I, you know, and, and, and she sends me this text, and she says, they will lay hands on the sick, and they will recover. They will cast out demons and they will speak with new tongues. These signs shall follow those that believe. And then she puts this. That word sign here, she likes to get deep into the word. I do too. I like to, I like to, I like to get into it. I like to, like I'm doing now, I'm breaking that down. So we're, got, we're going to see what that verse says. We know what the context of what he's saying is. And we always need to take those verses in context and setting and not out of context. But now we can get this full panoramic view of what he's saying there to get the depth of what he's saying to help us grow and mature and have a, amen, and to develop the way God wants to develop us. I don't know about you, but I'm hungry for more. I'm not satisfied where I'm at. I'm not ever going to be satisfied. I mean, I'm satisfied in him, but what I'm saying is I'm so hungry for more of him, I can't stay where I'm at. I can't, I can't today. I've got, to be, I've got to know Him more today or more tomorrow than I did today. I've got to press harder tomorrow than I did today. 
And she says this, that word sign, you know what it means? It means God's signature. It's His signature. These signs will follow them with belief. You know, I go places for revivals and I go preach and when I hear saints say this, it bothers me. They'll say, you know, that's why we're not seeing the miracles and the healings. And I'm like, where, where have you been? What's going on then? Because you can ask anybody that's been a part of this church. And I'm not saying we're, we've seen demons manifest. We've seen healings and miracles on a constant, regular basis throughout the whole time. It's never stopped. We're still seeing healings and miracles. We're still seeing signs and wonders. Luckily, they ain't demons manifesting every service because sometimes it should be the saints and they shouldn't have demons. But we've seen many of them. We've seen them stand here. We were standing. Some of y'all are standing right here. We were standing in a group right here. All of a sudden, a sister starts, starts praying in this aggressive tongue. All of a sudden, this lady runs back to the bathroom, runs into the bathroom. She said, I'm sick. I said, really? She come back out. She said, I got sick. I said, come here, sister. Let me lay hands on you. I put hands on her belly. You can ask anybody to stand here. She started growling. Like that, that demon started going crazy. Just like that. All I did was put hands on her. I didn't yell or nothing. That thing couldn't take it. I didn't let it continue to make a big phylactery in front of everybody. You know, because the devil wants to make a big scene. We didn't let him do that. We just we know our authority. Come out of him. Come out of her in Jesus' name right now. Come out. You have to go. You have to come out. In Jesus' name, you have to obey. He said he'd give us power over all power of the enemy. He said he'd give us power to cast out demons. Power to heal the sick, to cleanse the lepers. It's a delegated influence and authority so when she said that it it really so these signs will follow them that believe so when i hear people say they don't see miracles and and and, and healing i'm like what are you doing what are you what, what why are you not seeing it well i'll tell you why because we live in a church world that is surface level christianity Nobody wants to pay the price to see God really move and to see or, or to step out in faith and just operate like he says to do what he says to do and believe that he's going to oversee it this thing has to be true. You come too late to tell me this Bible's not true. But I remember making a decision, Brother Hank, one day I made a decision. I said, I'm going to listen to this word. I'm going to do what he says. I'm going to do exactly what he says. And he's going to do exactly what he says. Yeah. He's going to oversee his word to perform it. Exactly what it says. Lord, I'm all in. See, that was the kicker. That was the key. I said, Lord Jesus, I'm all in. I don't know you like I want to, but I want to know you more. I knew you by the Spirit, but I want to know you more. I want to prove this word to be true. I want to prove that exactly what you said, Jesus, you're going to do it. I want, I want everybody to know that you're real. I, want, I know, but I've experienced you, but I want this word and people to know this word is true. This word is real. So he said these signs would follow them that believe. What is that? That's God's signature. Yes, it is. That's his signature. That means he signed it. Yeah. Said he would watch over his word to perform it. Yeah. Hallelujah. Yes. So we're talking about coming into maturity and growing. So when you hear things that challenge your mind here... Don't throw them out necessarily. Go back and pray. Come to us. Let's discuss it. Because if you don't change the way you think or take inventory of your life, the way that you look and judge things, the way that you look at your own self, you'll never grow. Because if you don't change the way you think, you'll never change the way you speak. 1 Corinthians chapter number 3. Let's go there. Chapter number 3, verse 1 through 3. Is anybody getting anything? Yeah. And he says this, Brethren, I could not speak unto you as spiritual, but unto car as unto carnal even as unto babes in Christ. 
So he was talking to the Corinthian church right here. He was talking about divisions in the church. But he said, I have fed you with milk and not with meat, and hitherto you were not able to bear it. Neither now yet are you able, for you are yet carnal. Wherein as among you there is envy and strife and divisions, and you are you are not you're not carnal and walk as men. Are you not? He said. He was saying, Are you not? He was asking him a question. He said, There's still envying, there's still strife, there's still divisions. You know, are you not still carnal and walk as men? But we are men, Pastor. Yeah. But you're more than a man. Can I can I get deeper with you? Can I challenge you? You're more than a man. You're more than just a woman. Why? Because you're a new creation in Christ. And I can go back to the, to the example to, to Jesus, which was Son of God and Son of Man. Why was He Son of God? Because He came from heaven. God became flesh, dwelt among us. He was manifested in flesh. Son of Man, He was born of woman. Man lost it in the Garden of Eden. Man had to get it back. It took a man perfect to be the Lamb of God to be slain to take our place. It had to be a man. But this was the Lord Himself. He was without sin. Why was He without sin? Because it wasn't a man and a woman that came together. Holy Spirit overshadows Mary, which was a virgin, had never touched a man, had never been with a man. Holy Spirit overshadows her, and it says that out of that, He was mm, placed into the womb. God prepared Him a body. In, in, in the New Testament, it says God formed Him and prepared Him a body to dwell in. When you look at Jesus on the earth, it's pretty evident. He faced the same things that me and you faced. He was tempted in all points, yet without sin. At, at 30 years of age, he was anointed by who? By God. Why? Because he was operating as a man, as the Son of God in the earth. Why was he operating as the Son of God? Because he was the Son of God. He was in perfect and right standing with the Father. He was in perfect relationship with the Father. And God anointed him at 30 years of age. It says Jesus went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil. So if he went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil, he was our example, he was our standard. He was tempted in all points, yet without sin. That shows me that every sin that we've committed or had temptation of, he was tempted with it also. He was tempted to quit. He was tempted to give up. He was tempted in every single thing that you could ever imagine, every sin that you could ever name, and I'm not naming them. But what I'm saying is, is he was tempted in all points, yet he did not sin. He never bowed his knee to Satan. Not once. Even when he stood before the, the, the Pharaoh, when he, when he stood before him, he said, you'd have no power over me at all except to be given to you above. That's our king. I love to preach the gospel. Why? Because he's not, he's not a coward. He's not a bow. He, 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 he even told Pharaoh standing there in the face of death, knowing what he was going to do, he said, you'd have no... He didn't get mad. He didn't jump up and down. He just told him, he said, you, you, know, you know your authority. You don't have to do all that. You don't have to run around and jump up jump like that demon manifest. You don't have to get crazy. All I have to do is speak to it. You come out in Jesus' name. By faith, you have to go. That thing can't stay. It has to go. Why? Because you know who you are. See, that's called maturity. That's growing up as a son. That's growing up in your sonship. That's growing up in your authority that you have been delegated from Him. So He knew who He was. When Jesus knew who He was, He could stand before Pharaoh. He could stand before Him in the face of death, in the face of what He was fixing to do. And He could say, You have no power over me at all except it to be given to you from above. You could not touch me except it be given to you from above. That's your king. That's the Lord Jesus Christ that we serve. There was no coward in him. We get this wrong perspective of who he is. and He went about, he went about exercising authority over all the power of the devil. He didn't go around getting beat up on by the devil. He might have had people throw rocks at him and try to take him off the cliff, but they couldn't do it until it was time. He didn't walk around like he walked around in his authority. 
And everything responded to what he said. He healed the sick. He raised the dead. He, he cleansed the lepers. If they came and encountered him, they were touched and, they were touched and set free. If, they, if the demons came, they would, they would be like, Oh God, Lord, what can we do? Can you give us to the pigs? Can you let us go into the pigs? And he said, Yeah, go on into the pigs. The farmers about killed him, but they couldn't because it wasn't time. Because they was mad because the pigs ran into the ocean. Even the demons bowed to him. He didn't have to walk around holding up signs and talking about, hey, I, I'm all this and I'm all that. And I'm the son of God. I'm this and that. He didn't do that. He walked in his authority. He just walked around and they come up and he said, go on. Sick be healed. Lay hands on him. They drop him down in the thing. He's sick of the palsy. He's laid there like that. He said, son, thy sins be forgiven you. Oh, well, oh, who's this think he is? These religious Pharisees. Who's this guy think he is? What are you talking about? Sins be forgiven. Well, you think it's easier? I don't know your heart. I don't know what you're thinking and everything. You think it's easier? What you, which one do you think is easier? For sins to be forgiven or, or, or rise up and walk? I'll tell you what. Let me show you something that's already taken place in the inside. He's already been forgiven. Now I'm going to show you. Now rise up and walk. Take up your bed and get up. He didn't have to say in Jesus' name. He was Jesus. <laughs> that's a privilege that we get. <laughs> I say a privilege. That's a privilege that we get as Christians. He didn't have to do that. He just said, get up, and they got up. He said, get You know, there was some places, I get it, that, that their faith wouldn't, wouldn't allow him to do some of the works. That shows me right there that, that there were some things that he couldn't do, but he said we would do greater works. There were some places they didn't see him correctly. They didn't perceive him the, the right way. And he said he could do no mighty miracles in that place because of their perception of him. So it had something to do with their faith and responding and receiving from him also. So he couldn't do some things in some of the hometown, mostly as people that was close to him. All they knew him as is Joseph's son. All they knew him as is the carpenter, and he couldn't get him past that. So it says he could do no mighty works there, but he could do a few miracles, a few healings and stuff like that, and he just went on. So perspective starts to change when you start to see yourself in him clearly. And I always say this, clear, clear vision creates a clear channel. When you can see God clearly, when you can see the Godhead clearly, and then you can see yourself in Him clearly, and then you can see others the way that He sees them clearly. You know, everything begins to change in that moment. Because you see it through the mirror of the Word. And I know he said you see through it dark, dimly, and you, you, we only know in part. I get that, okay? I get all that. But he still wants to take us as a church to a higher place in him where we can walk the way that he said that we could walk. And we could be what he said that we could be. And we could have what he said that we could have. And that's why she was talking about and preaching, why that's something that really aggravates her. Why? Because of her background, things that she came through, things that we were that was imprinted us as a as a young as a young child and it carried over in our mindsets to our Christianity and 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 then we got some revelation and some anointing broke some yokes off of us and we realized who we were and we were like, hold on a second here. The devil's been deceiving us for too long. We know who we are. Amen. Are y'all okay for a minute? In Proverbs chapter 18 and verse 20 and 21. Proverbs chapter 18. Verse 20 and 21. He says, A man's belly shall be satisfied with the fruit of his mouth. And with the increase of his lips shall be filled. Death and life are in the power of the tongue, and they that love it shall eat the fruit thereof. And this word right here, a man's belly, I'm going to take you a little bit deeper. A man's belly, which right here, it means a womb. It means a belly, it means a body, it means as they were born, within, plus within, the womb. I want, to take you, I want to take you a little bit deep here for just a second. A man's belly, a man's womb shall be satisfied, have enough, be filled with what? The fruit, the fruit, listen, the fruit of his mouth. So that lets me know that there's something connected to the way that I speak to what's being put into me to what's being birthed through me. 
He related it to a womb. What happens in a womb? In a womb, things are, you know, what did Mary say? She she said, blessed is the fruit of my womb. Blessed is the fruit of my womb. Blessed is the fruit of my womb. So if the fruit of the womb, there's something connected there in a birthing process that happens, and he's talking about this here, and it has to do with the words that we speak. Are y'all following me? Can I keep going? Can I keep going? Are y'all, am I confusing anybody? Please tell me if I am. I'm breaking this down so simple. Listen, you got to see this because, you know, she was pregnant with the Word. And then the Word being manifested was the fruit of the womb, the thing that had been put in her and been, been cultivated. And been, we know the Word became flesh. That means the Word became, the Word came into manifestation. Here he's talking about blessed or, or, or a man's belly or man's, a man's womb, a man's birthing, pro, uh, the, the birthing process of your life, watch this, shall be filled or satisfied with the fruit of his mouth. We hear, word, we hear I don't know if y'all hear any teachings on the power of your words, but we're fixing to get into some of it here because it's all connected with the, maturity process, the maturing process. It's connected, and I'm going to tie all this together by the Holy Ghost. We're going to tie all this together to see that there's an importance here. That way, that, that's why when you start to grow up, you start to speak different. And when you start to think and speak different, your life starts to take a different route. Your life starts to begin to look different. I didn't know I was getting into this, but I did know, but I'm saying I didn't know that God was going to bring it out that way. So with the fruit of his mouth and with the increase... That's the produce of his lips. The produce of his lips. So a man's belly shall be satisfied with the fruit of his mouth and the increase of his lips shall be filled. Death and life are in the power of the tongue. Death and life are in the power of the tongue. That's why he said out of your belly would flow rivers of life-giving water. You ought to be giving life. You ought to be bringing life. To your situation and to those around you. Death and life are in the power of the tongue. The power of the tongue. The power of the tongue. Death and life are in the power of the tongue. Right here, that word power, one of the words there means direction. So death and life are in the direction of the tongue. The direction of the tongue. And they that love it shall eat the fruit thereof. They that love it shall eat the fruit. What is the fruit? The fruit is something that you can see on a tree. You can't see necessarily the root, but you can see the fruit. Fruit is something you can take a hold of and you can eat. So he said death and life are in the power of the tongue or the direction of the tongue. They that love it will eat the fruit thereof. Now I want you to go to... James chapter number 3, verse 1 through 6. James chapter number 3, verse 1 through 6. Are y'all getting anything here? Amen. I keep asking you to make sure you're with me. It says, my brethren, be not many masters. He's talking about teachers here, but I'm just I'm, I'm wanting to go into to the words and how important words are. And the importance of the words directing our life. So, my brethren, be not many masters, knowing that we shall receive the greater condemnation. That word masters, there's doctor, master, teacher, instructor. Be not many instructors, knowing that we shall see, receive the greater condemnation. For in, in, in all things we offend all, or in, in many things we offend all. If any man offend not, offend not in word, that means sin, fail, offend, stumble. Watch this, in, not in word. If any man offend not, or, or does not offend in his words, so there is a place that we can reach, That we do not offend in our words. That means offense there is, that is to trip, to err, to sin, fail, fall, stumble, offend. 
So he's showing us here what a perfect man is, which is a mature man. And he says, if any man offend not in word, the same is a mature or a perfect, a mature man, meaning a complete man of labor, growth, mental and moral character. A lot of times you can look at your life and you can judge the words that you've been speaking because he says this, Able also to bridle the whole body. Behold, we put bits in horses' mouth that they may obey us and we may turn about their whole body. Behold the ships when they they go so great are driven of forced winds, yet they are turned about with a very small helm, whithersoever the governor listeth. Even so the tongue is a little member and boasteth great things. Behold how great a matter a little fire kindleth. And the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. So is the, and we hear those, we hear those, we hear, you know, how many of you have been, y'all say that, no, no man can tame the tongue. That's, that's one of the, the scriptures we hear a lot, you know, no man can tame the tongue. That's true. No man can, but God can. You can't even walk out a Christian life without him, so you can't do it, but he can. He can help you to do it. He can empower you to do it. Hey, amen. So he can help you to tame the tongue. He can help you to talk different. He can help you to mature in the way that you think, but it's going to take you being a part of that plan and doing some work and growing and developing and confessing and talking in a different way that means that we once thought like a child you once thought like a child you once spoke like a child you once understood like a child but now you're starting to mature so now your ways of i'm prophesying to you now your ways of thinking are starting to change now your ways of Taking inventory of your life or starting to change. Inventory is very important. And I want to tell you why inventory is important. And we should do it on a daily basis. This is why. Because if there's a problem in my life, if there's something going on, if I'm not lining up in some area, whether it be financially, whether it be physically, meaning my physical health, if there's something in my life that's not lining up with the redemption plan, then I got to say, why is this? And I know we go through trials, and I know we go through... I'm not saying that. What I'm saying is, if you know there's something wrong, okay, and we don't take proper inventory of our life, okay, proper inventory would be a mature inventory. As we mature, we take a proper inventory of what's going on, what's happening. Is there sin? Is there something in my life that could be causing this? Is there something I'm not doing? Is there, is there, you know, he said, he that knoweth to do good and does not do it to him, it is sin. We don't want to talk about the knoweth to do good to him, it is sin. We don't want to talk about that because we know to do good and do it not to him, it is sin. So a proper inventory of our life. Jesus said, I am the great physician. He said, I've given you the helper, which is the Holy Spirit. I've given you another comforter to dwell with you, to be with you, to help you. I've given you my word. And when the word and spirit come together, something's going to happen. So if we take proper inventory, he said he's like a, he, he, what is he, like a can? He searches the inward parts, right? So he's going to always be convicting us or showing us or doing something as we're in this relationship with him. So when he starts to point something out in your life that's not really lining up with his word and where I'm supposed to be or what I'm supposed to be walking in in the redemption plan, then guess what? Then i got to take a proper inventory and I'm going to ask why. I'm going to get with God and say, what is it? Do I need to correct something? Is there something I need to repent of? Is there something I'm supposed to be doing I'm not doing? And I take proper inventory. And I take mature inventory. Mature inventory wouldn't be like a baby. Mature inventory would be like, sir, you know, like you're in the military. Sir, what, what's, what's going on here? You, most time you already know. Most time you, you already know what's going on. But you take proper inventory, you take mature inventory, and you start judging. He said he's the great physician. As we was talking about, he said he'd give you power over all power of the enemy. The, the, the power, he said that, that he would give you that authority, that power over all the power of the enemy. He said nothing shall by any means hurt you, but yet we're still, amen. So if he's given you that, what was we talking about? Uh, that power, we was talking about authoritative prescription. So Jesus is the great Position and he gives you the prescription. He gives you the way to walk in victory in this life. He gives you the way to walk in victory and have life here now, life in abundance until it overflows. 
if he's given you that and there's something in, in your life that you're not necessarily walking in that way, then I go back to a place of proper inventory and I'm looking at the way that I talk. I'm thinking about what I've been saying because so many times we get these, we get these sayings that's not scriptural and we start to take them and we start to speak them and before long, if you're not careful, faith comes and you know, believe in your heart, speak with your mouth and you'll have whatsoever you say. Why? Because he was talking about the, the, the tongue being a little member but yet boasting great things. It being like a helm on a ship. What's that mean? It's steering the ship. Yeah. Your words are steering your life where you're going. That's why, we, that's why we believe in prophecy. That's why I prophesy where the church is going. I don't prophesy where we're at. I know where we're at. I ain't got to see that. I know where my life is, but I'm prophesying where I'm going. We're speaking something that's coming. We're speaking where we're going, where we're headed, what's coming. Praise God, where God's taking us by faith. Praise God. I'm speaking into my life where I'm going, where I'm headed, not where I'm at. I know where I'm at. I know exactly where I'm at. And I know the reality of it. I'm not discounting where I'm at and what's going on. But I'm taking proper inventory. Why? And I'm prophesying where I'm going and where I'm headed. That's why when something sickness or something tries to get on my body, I don't discount their sickness there. I can feel it. You ain't got to tell me. I don't even have to have a doctor tell me that I got a fever and that things are coming out of all the places and things are happening. I don't have to have nobody tell me that. That's the truth. But what I do declare is what his word says that I'm healed by his stripes. He said that I, amen. He said by his stripes I'm already healed. So I'm declaring what his word says by faith even though it hadn't manifested yet. But I know sooner or later his word will come to, into manifestation if I stay in agreement with it and I don't let the circumstances of my life deter me or, or, or steer me away from the truth of his word. Because sometimes the circumstances, yet they'd be so strong they might knock you down. But listen, they didn't knock you out. So you got to get back up and you got to get back on your feet and you got to start declaring what his word says. How did he, what did Joshua say? He said, Thy word I have hid in my heart. Why? So I would not sin against you. Your word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against you. So yet I know the, the facts. I get the facts, but I'm prophesying what God said and his word is true. It doesn't matter what the circumstances say. His word is true in your life. And he'll oversee his word to perform it. But what he needs is you to come into agreement with it to speak it despite the circumstances, despite the naysayers, despite what it looks like. He needs some people that's going to take his word and stand on it and believe it and will not have anything else. That's faith grabbing a hold of the title deed of what God has promised in his redemption by his blood he has provided. And taking a hold of that and saying, I'm not having anything else. I am the redeemed of the Lord. Praise God. I am prosperous in all that I do. All that I put my hand to do, it shall prosper. It shall succeed. I am healed by his stripes. Praise God. I am the redeemed of the Lord. I have the mind of Christ. Come on, somebody. Somebody needs to shout. I don't know about you, but that makes me happy. Why? Because I am the redeemed of the Lord. My mind is sharp. Praise God. I have the mind of Christ. I have a mind to think with. He's given me power over all power of the enemy today. And nothing shall by any means hurt me. I have a full supply. He will not fail me and leave me without support. He will not do it because he said he wouldn't. Amen. So my, my, my words start lining up to the direction or my life starts following the direction of my words. And there's power. The power of life and death is there. In your tongue. In your words. The power of life and death is in your tongue. So when you hear somebody that talks positive, that's, man, you can just hear them. You know, they're talking about where they're going. They don't care. I mean, they might be walking down the road and they're like, brother, I'm going to own a company one day. You know, I'm not talking about to, to, to want the things of the world, but maybe there's something down on the inside of them that says, God's want me to start a business, a company, and they're walking on foot. I'm going to have a company. <laughs> I'm going to own that company. You know what I'm saying? I'm just saying, I'm using that as an example, you know, and you see them walking, you're like, that fool, he is crazy. He ain't even got a bicycle to ride and he talk. He's walking down there to hitchhike to get to work. There you go. I just said something. He's walking down there to hitchhike to get to work because he's going to own a company. And he's willing to pay the price and do whatever it takes. He ain't just sitting there talking about it. He's talking and walking. 
His life's going in that direction. He said in Deuteronomy, He said He'd give you power to get wealth, to create wealth. Why? So He could establish His covenant with your fathers, is what He told them. So He could show Himself and He could establish His covenant. Power to get, power to go, power to do. But I'm doing and I'm speaking. I remember the first job I got. I was out. I didn't have no license or no vehicle. I knew this Jesus had saved me. I knew he had saved me, sister. I knew I wasn't that drug addict and I wasn't that rotten, no down dirty, low down dirty dog that I was. And I knew that. And I was willing to do whatever it took. Whatever it took. And I remember, I, I, I remember talking. I, I got, a, I got a, the first job I got. Didn't have a license, a vehicle. Had no family in the town. I was in. I, I got off the bus in Cookville, Tennessee, with no license, just a one-way ticket to this place that God was leading me to. Didn't have nobody to help me. But God provided people when I needed it. But I had nobody I could pick up the phone and call and say, "Hey, come help me. Come do this. Come to, not in this place." And I remember I thought, well, this guy gave me a job. He gave me a job for $7 and something an hour. I didn't care. I took it. I was willing to do whatever it took. For the first time in my whole entire life, I wanted to be honest. I wanted to work, and I wanted to pay my bills. Never had paid a bill. Never had worked. Never had been responsible. Never. See, I'm being transparent with you. Open book. So I had enough money. I went and got me a bicycle. I thought, well, it's two miles away from here. I'm going to get a bike, and I'm going to ride it to work. That's what I'm going to do. So I rode a bike to work. I was the happiest person you ever seen working $7 something hour you ever seen in your life. I'm witnessing everybody. I'm praying for everybody. I'm telling everybody about this Jesus. I'm riding a bike out there doing pull-ups on their stairs before they get to work. I'm there an hour before the thing even opens. I'm waiting on them to pull up. I can't wait to get in here and work. Praise God. God, give me a chance. Give me a job. Praise God. I'm happy. I'm excited, man. You see what I'm talking about? I'm talking and I'm doing, but I'm doing whatever it takes. You got to make that decision. I'm going to do whatever it takes. I'm not lazy. I'm not going to lay around. I'm not going to sit around and try to slip off the government. You know, I'm not doing that. I'm not living that life. I'm going after God. What God leads me to do, I'm going to put my hand to it. I'm going to put my hand to the plow. I'm going to do the best that I can. I'm going to be as faithful as I can. I'm going to be as honest as I can. I'm going to try to represent His integrity well. Praise God, you've got to make that commitment. I'm going to seek after His righteousness and His kingdom, which is His character. I'm going to seek to represent Him well. I'm going to look at the end of the day for one to stand before or, and, and, and stand approved before. Second job that I got, this guy was talking to him about construction. I said, hey, I really need to get out of this job. I prayed about it. I said, I can't work here no more. There was two homosexuals, you know, guys. They were hard to be around and listen to them. But I was praying for them. I witnessed to them. I prayed. I laid hands on them. I did all this stuff, but I couldn't listen to their, you know, stuff that much. I was like, Lord, I'll do whatever it takes. I'll stay here as long as you want. Please give me another job. I can't take it no more. But I will for you. See, you see the you see the difference. I wasn't I wasn't being, and I'm not saying I was all that. I'm just telling you the facts. But I said, Lord, but whatever it is, I'll do it for you. If it's to work here, if it's to whatever it is, I'll do it. But please give me another job. Ain't got to be something better. All of a sudden, I start talking to this this other guy, and he owns a construction company and I framing houses I thought well praise God man yeah get me a, you know and he's like well I talked to him about two or three times I said well I said can I uh, can, will you hire me he said well he said are you scared of heights I said yes sir but I'll overcome it I'm being honest with you and I was being honest with him I wasn't trying to be something I wasn't I just said I'll overcome it God will help me he said do you have a car I said no sir I got a bike. He said, do you got a license? I said, no, sir, but I'm going to get them. He said, well, you don't meet none of the criteria. He said, I got, you got to have them three to even, for me to even think about it. I said, sir, just give me a chance. I don't know how it's going to work out, but God's going to work it out for me. I know he will. He's not brought me this far to let me down and leave me. And this is how I talk to him. My God wasn't going to fail me. My God wasn't going to let me down. He didn't bring me to 
this town to let me fall and fail. He didn't know it, but I knew it. And, and about three times, three conversations, he said, man, I just like the way you talk. I said, just give me a chance. Tell me where it's at. I will get there. If I have to hitchhike, I'll get there. Please, just give me a chance. He said, I'll tell you what, I've got a job about a mile and a half from where you're living at that halfway house. I'll tell you what I'm going to do. You ride that bike down there in the morning. He said, you got a job. I said, what time do I need to be there? He said, 6 o'clock. I said, I'll be there at 530 I got up at 3 o'clock, I cooked me a breakfast, I got on my bike, packed me a lunch, I strapped that thing on, got the directions, because we didn't have GPS, I got the directions to it, I thought, well, I found out where it was at, and I headed out about 4.30, 5 o'clock that morning, 5.30, I'm sitting on the job, I was sitting there when the sun started coming up, 6 o'clock, and the first, first car pulls in the driveway, I'm sitting on my bike. I'm waiting to work this new job. Man, I couldn't wait. Thank you, Lord, for giving me a chance. Thank you, Lord, for saving me. Thank you for giving me an opportunity. He didn't throw me out when I deserved it. I'm showing you something here. I'm showing you the words in my life and the direction and the, the price that you must pay and the, the things that you must endure, but you've got to commit to say, I'm going to do whatever it takes. Say that. I'm going to do whatever it takes. Come on, say that. I'm going to do whatever it takes. I'm going to do whatever it takes. Whatever it takes. Whatever it takes. Because He's working with me. He's working with you. He's working for you. That day, and, and for about two months, three months after that, you know what my confession was? I'm facing fears. I'm overcoming my fears. I'm, over, I'm facing them and I'm overcoming them. I'm facing them and I'm overcoming. The first day we had to get up on the roof and I was so scared of heights I was about to throw up. But I said, I'm facing fears. I'm overcoming them. God help me. I'm going to overcome them. Yeah. End of that day, first day. I'm going to leave with I'm going I'm I'm to close here in a minute. The first day, on my bike, ride my bike to work. We're at lunchtime and we're talking and this guy starts talking to me. Where do you live? Where are you from? I'm from East Tennessee, from up in Knoxville or Anderson County. He said, Anderson County, I used to be with a woman up there. I said, really? He said, yeah. She had a son named Billy Joe Dude. You know, I won't say his name because we're on the line. But he said, said his name and I was like, really? I used to go to school with this dude. Hold on a second. Let's get some information here. Uh, find out, come find out. He was with the mom and they lived together and they was, he was the stepdad to that family. And I was like, I went to school with these people. This is crazy. He said, yeah. So we, we got a connection there. So end of the day, I wasn't asked now. I got on my bike, I'm ready to ride home. Man, I done, I'm facing fears. I'm facing fears. I'm overcoming it. Come on, some of you need to just say, I'm overcoming. I'm going to overcome it. I'm going to face some fears. You just need to know who's for you. My God, when you know who's for you, you're going to face them. You're going to face the giants. You're going to face them. I heard that guy holler, hey. I said, what? He said, are you riding the bike? I said, yes, sir. He said, get that bike and throw it in the back of my van. You ain't riding no bike home. I said, thank you, sir. Put my bike in the back of his van. I sat down in there. He said, you give me $20 a week. He said, I'll come and get you every day and I'll take you home. Wherever we're working at. I said, you got a deal. Guess what? Last day I rode a bicycle. In a have to case to work. Are you seeing something here? I'm showing you the bare minimum. And I know a lot of us are way past that. But what I'm saying is. Is I'm showing you something. And, and relating this to. to the, see we're still going somewhere. We're, we're in a different place now. We're in a different level. Facing new fears. Facing new giants. Facing different things. Than we are. Or than when I was then. Ten years ago. But look from ten years to where we are now. To what God's doing now. Faith is a, a life that you live with God and you, you build it and, and He builds you and he, 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 he challenges you and He prepares you and He tests you and He strengthens you and He takes you through His ways of doing things to prepare you for what He's wanting to do and where He's wanting to take you. So many times we, we hinder the process because we get selfish. We get selfish. 
when we don't realize that when we're all that he created us to be, we bring him glory. When they see your life and they say only Jesus could do that. That's right. Let me tell you about him. Let me, let me tell you about him. Yeah. He's, let me t- I know him. And, and, and the thing is, I want you to know him. And what he's done for me, he'll do more for you. Because you've heard my testimony. So you, you, that spirit of prophecy, you can, you can, go, you can go further now. Yeah. You, you, our pain, our pain, uh, older Christians, look, you know, uh, your, pain, your pain can be their breakthrough. Your pain and your things that you struggled with, things that you went through, can be someone else's breakthrough and victory to take them way further, way faster. And why would you want to do that? Because you're a Christian and you want others to come up. That's why. Because you have the love of God in you and you don't want them to face what you did. You want them to go on. You want them to preach. You want them to represent Him well. Because that's who you are and that's who we are. And I'm going to close with this scripture right here. In Matthew chapter 12 and verse 37, it is an amplified version. You can read 33 through 37. He said... For by your words, reflecting your spiritual condition. Reflecting your spiritual condition. You will be justified and acquitted of guilt, of sin. By your words, rejecting me, you will be condemned and sentenced. I'm showing you something in how important words are. And that you have the power to either give life, to bring life, or to bring death. Because he said the power of life and death was in your tongue. God help us here. I'll close with this one scripture. I want to I get one more little story here. I remember I got into my word. Thank God for a relationship with God. I got into my word one day and I had asthma, I had hepatitis, where I, where I was shooting drugs, all kind of stuff. I don't have it no more. I'm, 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 I am clean bill of health. No asthma. Had asthma all my life. You know, I had to suck, you know, using an inhaler all my life. Smoke cigarettes, smoke dope, smoke crack, smoke everything. The old man did. And I got a word in Second Peter one day, and he said, by, by, by my stripes you were already healed. Brother, I was just crazy enough to believe it. Brother Jason, I was crazy enough to believe that word. And I'm still crazy enough to believe it. And I was young. You know, I'm in a prison cell at this time. Now he said, by his stripes, I'm here. I thought, man, I'm already healed. Sister, I'm already healed. I ain't even looking at that no more. He told me I'm already healed. Whoa. Whoa. So for two years, I walked around. Of course, I gave up the tobacco, and I got delivered from the cigarettes, and I laid those things down that would hinder the process. I laid those things down on an altar and got delivered of them. And I said, uh, I remember the day I got delivered of the dip. I used to dip, you know, and I, I, I was dipping. And, uh, and I knew I, the Holy Spirit was working on me and telling me, you know, you need to give that up. You know, you need to, need to quit. You need to quit. And it started making me feel funny. It started making me feel different. And I was sitting there. My mom come in there one day before I was married. And she says this. She says, Derek, she said, if you give up dip, I'll give up cigarettes. I said, can I have one more? She said, yes. Yeah. So I put about a five-finger dip in True story. True story. I put a, a whole, as much as I could pack down in my lips, and I sucked it to the last drop. I dipped that thing till they wasn't no more juice. They wasn't nothing else could come out of it. I'm telling you the truth. This has been, this has been 10 years ago. And uh, I walked out there. Actually, I took the dip, and I turned that can upside down. I dipped it to the last drop. Might have swallowed some of it. I don't know. (laughs) 
I loved it. I did. I loved that stuff. Loved it. Loved a good dip. I went out there, washed it out when it was done. Walked in there. I got on my knees in the be- in the bedroom, like I always did. I had I had calluses on my knees, and where I'd pray, and I lifted my hands and I said, "Lord Jesus." I said, you've delivered me. This is about how the prayer went. You've delivered me from the, the drugs. I know you're real. I believe in you with everything within me. And I need your help right now. I've, I've, I've used this nicotine and this tobacco for a lot of years. And I said, I really like it. I said, but I know I've got to let it go. And I need your help to do it. I can't do it without you. I'm just showing you a prayer of humility. Yeah. This is, I might not be getting the words right, but I'm showing you the heart posture. And I said, but, but I'm going to lay it down on this altar. I'm going to lay it down today, and I'm going to ask you to take it from me, take the cravings from me and everything, and I believe you're doing it right now because I've asked you. And I'm willing to do my part and give it up. So I'm going to lay it down and, and, and just take it. And um, Lord, I thank you that I'm delivered from this dip and I'm delivered from it. And it was almost like by faith I could feel the, the nicotine and everything just come out of my body. I could, I could almost feel it because I knew Holy Spirit, I knew Jesus was alive in me. And I said, Father, I thank you for it. I, I stepped up from that prayer that day. It was the last day I ever took a dip of skull. I never had one craving. There was one time I was at work and I got a taste in my mouth. And I held my hands up. I said, no. I said, Lord, you've taken the craving from me. You've taken that from me. I thank you for it. And he delivered me. Are you following me? I did my part. And he did his. He did his part. I did my part. He's the deliverer. He's the savior. He's the healer. But I've got a part to play. It's a partnership. And when I walk out what he has promised, who gets glory? I don't. He does. does. I say he's the healer. When I walk healed, I bring the healer glory. This is what I want to get to, and I'm going to close with this. I know, I know, I know. Preachers do this. Pastors do this. But I'm feeding you today with faith. I'm giving you something that's going you're going to take home that's going to help you. Amen. And I held up, or I confessed that scripture. I got that word, and I said, "Lord, by 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 your stripes, I'm already healed. I'm already healed." I'm already healed. I thank you, Lord, that I'm already healed. So for two years, I'm confessing this, and I'm still having problems. And and I'm not telling you all to do what I did. I'm just telling you I did what the Lord led me to do, and I did that and made that choice personally. I'm not telling you to throw away medication or any of that. Mark that down. I would never tell you that. I'm telling you what I did, okay? I got out. I threw that inhaler away. I said, I'm already healed. (laughs) Well, I couldn't tell it sometimes. But his word said it. And I'm going I'm to prove this word to be true. I'm going to prove you to be true. I, I, I know you are and I believe it. And whether it came or whether it didn't, your word's still true. Understand that. Whether it manifested or whether it didn't, I'm, I'm still to, you're still true. Because my circumstances doesn't determine if he's real and true or if his word is true. That don't determine what, 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 his, what his truth is. That's why we hear a lot of we hear a lot of we hear a lot of doctrine, but we hear a lot of things that's just circumstances, and people will take their circumstances and they make the word fit their circumstances yeah. to make it okay because they like their oven faith yeah. or don't want to fight it, so they make it okay. And so they create this whole doctrine that's not scriptural because it's just their pain or their struggle and it's not redemption. Yeah. I confessed it for you know, to, got out and then I got led to a meeting. And we, we, right before I got married, I was sitting in there, and a prophet calls me out in the, the aisle. They didn't know me. He comes over there, gives me a word in tongues. Uh, 
she prophesies. They, 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 they lay hands on me. I fall out in the spirit. I'm laying there. I go deaf for a minute. I couldn't hear nothing, but people's all in this place. There's hundreds of people in this meeting. I don't even know what they said. I had to ask people what they said. I'm laying there on the ground. All of a sudden, I feel this warm honey come down, come into my lungs, and it go like this, like static electricity on top of my lungs. And I'm laying there, and I'm like, whoa. And I, I laid there for however long. And it was like he turned the sound on. All of a sudden, the sound turns on, and I could hear again. We get out in the car, and I'm sitting in the car. I said, I'm healed. She don't know what's going on. I'm just dating her. She already thinks I'm crazy. <laughs> no, she already knows I'm crazy. <laughs> She's like, who is this dude, man? <laughs> who is this tattooed up preacher guy, man? And, 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 and I, I, said, I, I said, you don't understand. I'm healed. She said, you're healed? I know. What do you mean? I'm healed. Yeah. It manifested. First time in my whole life I was able to take a breath and the top of my lungs filled up. Yeah. I would go like this for years. I played sports and everything with it. And I'd go like this. I'd go, it'd get to a certain point and it'd catch and I couldn't go no further. My lung wouldn't take it. But at that moment, when that, when that warm honey, that healing anointing, that miracle anointing went into me, scripturally, you know, we're scripture. We're talking about healing anointings. We're talking about di something different. We're talking about different. Di we're talking about mature stuff. And, and, and this static electricity, top of my lungs like this, God was healing my lungs through a special anointing with the prophet, that the prophet had carried. What I confessed for two years manifested. I didn't care how he brought it. I didn't care if somebody walked up to me on the street and slapped me and I got healed and it manifested. It didn't matter. What mattered was I had been declaring that and confessing that and now... It came and manifested, meaning it came forth. Yeah. Hallelujah. Those of you online, listen, I pray that this has encouraged your faith. We want to stay supernatural. We want to keep God real in your life. We want to know that we've got a part to play. And it's a partnership while we're here. Amen. And we want you to know that we love you guys. We're praying for you. If you need prayer, reach out to us. There's a lot of people that watch us and that reach out to us, PM us and stuff like that. So um, we're praying for you guys. Just be praying for our church, our ministry, things that's, that's happening. Uh, be praying for the people that's here and what God's doing uh, with us. We're honored. And uh, we love you guys in Jesus' name. Amen. If I could get the worship team, please, to come. See, I get to tell those stories.